Now, Sir William Osler, who is the physician who, uh, who started most of modern medicine in this country, said that faith is the great mover of mankind, yet it cannot be weighed in the laboratory scale or measured by our instruments. So the fact that science cannot not grapple with this issue of life after death does not bother me at all. And I want to challenge you all today to see the near-death experience in an entirely different light than I have seen the debate in the, the, you know, the community and in the TV and such as that. I want to challenge you to look at the near-death experience as something which tells us about the process of living. And in fact, I believe that near-death experiences hold the key to understanding this elusive mind-body problem which has boggled philosophers and scientists alike for thousands of years. The near-death experience to me is a spiritual experience which occurs at a point, point of death. My first scientific study after hearing Crystal Merzlach's story was to assure myself that these experiences were not the results of a lack of oxygen to the brain or the many medications that they're given during resuscitation and such as that. And I published that in 1985 and rather than rehash here and for all the people who've heard me lecture before, I'll just tell you that I feel quite confident that near-death experiences are not what we commonly call hallucinations. They are not caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain, and they are not caused by narcotics, anesthetic agents, or really anything, any other factors that I could identify except the process of dying. Now, this then led me to a second study in which I became interested in the light that these children described. And I became convinced that this light is the transformative element of the near-death experience. For the past three years, I have now studied people who have had that experience of light in a variety of situations. And it is clear to me that you do not have to be near death to have a near-death experience. There seems to be a lot of quibbling about this. How close to death are they? And they're not really so dead. And uh, I know that, uh, <laughs> well, you know, you all laugh. But remember that headline, dramatic new proof of life after death. And that seems to be where the debate is. I recently was on a TV show, NBC national TV show. I gave to them. They asked me, gosh, has anybody had this experience? Oh, I had someone had a beautiful experience, wonderful experience, moving. They said, I'm sorry, that person's not acceptable to us because they, they weren't near death by their definitions. And yet, my second study, which I'm not going to tell you about today, has shown beyond a doubt that this experience of light is the essential element of the near-death experience and that that is a experience which can be tapped while jogging, while meditating, while praying, or while having dreams. And I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. But I looked over the medical literature. I've told you what near-death experiences are. There aren't all these hallucinations and drugs, etc. But as I looked over the medical literature, I discovered that actually for 50 years it's been known that we have an area in our brain which generates these kinds of experiences. And back in the 40s and 50s, when they did this kind of wacky stuff, they used to take a silver electrodes and stick them into people's brains and just basically zap different areas of the brain. And that's almost all of what we know about how the brain functions was gained through those studies. And sure enough, in the right temporal lobe of the brain is an area which causes people to leave their body, have heavenly visions, and such as that. So here then we seemingly, we seem to have some sort of contradiction. This is puzzling to people and this is what I decided was what I was going to talk about today. Is why is this seeming contradiction that there's an area in the brain which 
there is no doubt about it. I mean, this, you know, rather, you know, that would be a lecture in itself, but there's no question that there's an area of the brain which generates these experiences. And yet, I said that there are spiritual experiences which happen to people when they die. So how can we resolve that contradiction? And if you'll bear with me, I hope that at the end of the hour, I'll be successful. But I can tell you that this concept, that there's an area of the brain which triggers these spiritual experiences has excited interest in medical sciences throughout the world. I have now working with psychiatrists at the University of Tokyo, psychiatrists at the University of Zambia. It's really interesting to hear African near-death experiences that, you know, start off patient trampled by an elephant. Or, you know, uh, <laughs> it's fascinating and uh, Australia and New Zealand and particularly Eastern uh, Europe. So I, I feel pretty uh, secure in telling you that 20 years from now, what we, the lessons we've learned from children, well, I study children uh, primarily, will, re will really lead to a renewed integration of man's technological genius. That we are going to see a coming together of our spiritual and our technological capabilities. And that we're going to have an understanding of things which are kind of on the fringe now. Faith healing, ESP, psych psychics, and all of this kind of stuff, I believe will come together in one integrated theory of brain function in another 10 or 15 years. And we will start to understand that we are spiritual beings. And the near-death experience reflects on the spiritual impoverishment of our society. It was 23 years ago that I was critically burned. Um, mine it was not a case where I was hooked up to machines and people were there to watch me die and, and you can't look at my case and say this proves it. Um, I was in isolation. I was pretty much just expected to die. There was no one there. And this is an odd thing to say, but I think the average everyday life in this country Hell. <laughs> well, I have everything one could ask for. <laughs> um, but I, I believe the point was very well made that we live in the most non spiritual society, very violent society, materialistic, and it's very hard after seeing what can be to see what we do. That's why we can't understand these experiences. And that's why they don't fit into the ni nice, neat questions that we've been asking for the last 50 and 100 years. We now need to come up with new questions and new ways of dealing with this experience. I have no, I have no doubt that my localizing this experience within the brain will be a tremendous help in that process. Because to the medical world, that makes it real. And see, and that's what everyone, that's the question. Are these experiences real? But before we can answer that, we have to know what is reality itself. And basically, we're dealing with outmoded theological concepts and outmoded medical concepts. Now, the theological concepts, though, are not quite as outmoded as, uh, you know, when, when I got actually reading about religion and stuff, I'm not a particularly religious person myself or, or really a particularly spiritual person, but I got to reading about it, and I discovered to my great interest that virtually all of the ancient religions, be they ancient Celtic religions, ancient Oriental religions, Hindu religions, what have you, virtually all of those religions believe that when you die, you merge into the ultimate reality. Well, I've heard that. It was real, Dr. Morse. It was realer than real. You know, I, I've heard people describe that ultimate reality. And I was talking with my nurse, who, who is very uh, religious, and she told me that her religious teachings are very similar to what these children report. The soul separates from the body, that the soul goes to a place that we think of as paradise, and then ultimately goes to a heaven which men are not allowed to know the nature of heaven. And yet, too often we analyze these issues as if 
heaven is some kind of, uh, I don't know, it's some asteroid floating off of Jupiter that, you know, that someday we'll discover with, with, our, uh, you know, with our new space uh, telescope. That's why I'm coming back to my statement at the beginning, the tabloid headloids, the headlines, proof of life after death. These concepts such as heaven and such as that are clearly for after, after death. And, uh, you know, there's, there's no question about that in my mind, and that certainly fits with what I understand as to what most human beings have believed throughout most of human history. It's only this peculiar sort of uh, Western uh, religious beliefs for the last three or four hundred years which seem uh, to uh, have a great deal of difficulty with this kind of issue. And I, I do, I get lots of letters from people who believe, they believe that these children's statements are the devil's lie. First time Mark told us, he still did not have much vocabulary because he still had not learned to say anything in words vocally. During the whole time his trach was in, he could never make a sound. He, he sat down beside his dad and he was having lunch and he said, Dad, you know what? And his dad said, what? He said, you know I died. His dad said, oh, 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 you did? And we just kind of like, you know, we don't know what to do now. And he said, yeah. And his dad said, well, what happened? And he said, it was really, really dark, Daddy. And then it was really, really bright. And I ran and I ran and it didn't hurt anymore. And his dad said, where were you running, Mark, down the street? And he said, oh, Daddy. I was running up there. Mark had not been out in the public. He had never been to church or Sunday school. He had never been to the grocery store. He could have no people into the house. He lived a very isolated life. There was no way he could have known about these things that he's telling us. And he said he didn't hurt anymore. And the man talked to him. And his dad said, did he, what kind of words did he say? And he said, he didn't talk like this, Daddy. He talked like this. Because he couldn't tell you with his little vocabulary that it was through the mind and it didn't come out this way. He said, he talked this way to me. And he said, I didn't want to come back, Daddy, but I had to. And then as he, we were, didn't know what to say. We didn't know what, what to understand what was going on. We never heard of this. And we asked both his doctor and his surgeon and his pediatrician, and they were saying to us, to let him talk, to, to just let him talk. And no one knew how to help us with it. So as he told people, they would laugh scoff him. Only his family believed him, so he repressed it. For many, many years, he never talked about it. Because when he did, people made fun of him. And he never again would tell another living soul until Dr. Morris came into his life. And the first time Dr. Morris talked to Mark, Mark's head was like this. It was like, okay, you're not going to believe me now. I know it. And Dr. Morris believed him, and I saw my son's head come up, and I saw him smile for the first time in 18 years. Somebody besides his mother and father believed that he was telling the truth. The people, at least on the critical care unit where I worked, um, named the last person that they would ever talk to about their experience was their doctor. My challenge to you all today is to look at our own society and see how the near-death experience reflects on our just our total invalidation of spirituality. And this is funny, even coming out of my mouth from a medical doctor, to be honest with you. <laughs> but this is the This is what I wanted to share with you today. When we say psychological, when I say this patient's problem is psychological, I mean, and people hear that as just psychological. And by doing that, by devaluing these experiences, by trivializing them, by thinking of them as hallucinations, has caused us to devalue our own spiritual experiences. And the way I've learned this is from the people who write to me. Because what I've discovered is that most people, when they die, have these kinds of experiences. A child dies and just briefly says, the light, the light. And oftentimes, that experience is missed or ignored. I would like to see the near-death experience bring back the old-fashioned deathbed scene. I would like to see hospital social workers and doctors and janitors and whatever talking about these experiences 